Previously on Solve the World. What about Marshall? Is he okay? He's in his own room, having his own conversation. Solve the World, a fictional adventure told in 100 episodes. The world must perish so that he is not armed. Episode 52, The Troglodyte. Days after Jennifer Dash went through the Kaaba, the United States reciprocated the failed bombing attempt by the Russians with a nuclear strike on a small military compound in the Ural Mountains. The thought by national leaders was that this was a relatively low casualty location. By bombing the Russians, but doing so in an obscure place, the world would understand that America meant business, but that the attack would be understandable, even from the big brass at the Kremlin itself. They were wrong. Six days later, the U.S. became convinced that the real Cuba Missile Crisis was set in the 21st century, not the 20th. And, since JFK was not president, the action spiraled toward a darker resolution. Not willing to face the real possibility of a nuclear strike on American soil, the United States bombed Havana to hell. Minutes after, special ops forces attempted to assassinate nine heads of state in Moscow. They were unsuccessful. Moscow pushed the red button, sending three nuclear missiles straight for Washington, D.C. All three were shot out of the sky. But the damage was done. Calling in favors, the U.S. had secret bunkers in Poland launch nuclear strikes on Moscow, St. Petersburg, and with intelligence saying that Belarus, specifically its capital city, was effectively Russia's backup center of operation, Minsk was H-bombed as well. Later that day, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Seattle, and Las Vegas were bombed. Due to the frenetic nature of that day, U.S. intelligence was unsure of where those strikes came from. The very next day, taking advantage of the craziness, Pakistan pulled off a covert bombing in New Delhi. Iran invaded Saudi Arabia. And Britain and Australia trolled the South China Seas, expecting Russia to make a play for China as an urgent safeguard and or war ally. A week later, bombs went off in Houston, Dallas, Kansas City, and surprisingly, Mexico City. Drones fought back by delivering Hyperion nukes to seven of Russia's ten largest cities, as well as Kiev. For three weeks, there was something of a lull. Then, world-shattering chaos. Evidence surfaced that the bombings on America's western seaboard came from China. Twenty Chinese cities were bombed in an American blitzkrieg. Responses came not just from the Chinese, but bewilderingly from Europe. Russian leaders still breathing convinced the EU that the only way the sudden WW3 would end would be with essentially ending the bombing-crazed United States of America. Missiles launched from outside of Paris, Brussels, Rome, and Berlin flattened the American Northeast. The effects were not as they had intended, however, since the president was safe and sound at Camp David. Given his cowboy-like demeanor and the essential evisceration of the other two branches of the government, as a dictator in arms, the president okayed mass bombing over continental Europe. There would be no relenting, no quieting of tears, no forgiveness, and no one left to offer remorse. And yet, somehow, the world kept turning. When the doors opened,
Miles was as surprised as anyone to see Sir Isaac dead in a pool of his own blood, and not see the other two people that accompanied the scientist in the Kaaba alone. There wasn't much Miles Falk could do in the immediate aftermath. There were too many. He couldn't talk his way out of being arrested. He and Bashrina were both caravaned to a seedy, soddy underground detention silo. This was an annoyance. Between interrogations, Miles easily had enough time on his hands to put the story together. Marshall, and frankly, maybe even Jen herself, had figured out that Sir Isaac wanted to use the Graviton machine somehow for himself. So Marshall took Sir Isaac out of the picture. Whether Jen was involved in the deviousness or not was besides the point. The real point was, despite the blood, the thing worked. The Graviton machine was taking people out of this world. And it was just in the nick of time. Problem was, Isaac was the only connection to the actual engineer of the machine. The machine that imploded upon every use. A machine that all of humanity desperately needed duplicated or expanded. Two days after Jen and Marshall disappeared, Mecca was in an uproar. Apparently, a noisy captain of the guard had recorded an interrogation he did with Bashrina. The video had gone viral. It was all part of the Lilith Babbitt conspiracy that the internet had swiftly begun to obsess over. Bashrina used the name Jen Darzi, a common Arabic surname, but the internet folks saw through that veil sure enough. Intriguingly, the whole Jen Dash Disappearance Act had caused not just an uproar about the Kaaba, but a mass pilgrimage to Mecca and to Islam itself. More Qurans were sold in the week after Jen's disappearance than in any other week previously recorded in history. Reports also were spewing out of every corner of the globe that Jen was amongst the people. A phone video on a train in Tokyo alleged to have caught Jen on camera there. Another video saw her apparently, literally, swimming with dolphins in the Amazon basin. Yet another video powerpointed through the Pope's schedule at the Vatican, making a convincing argument that he was visiting with Jen once a day from 4.07 to 4.15 every afternoon in a terrace just outside of the Pope's abode. Most certainly the Pope was visiting with someone, but there was no good reason to believe that he was carving out eight minutes of every day to meet with Jen herself. It could have been anyone in the world. Upon escape from the Saudi authorities, Miles had little use for any Jennifer Collin conspiracy. He wanted to believe that she was nowhere on Earth. He wanted to believe that she had successfully escaped all of this. He wanted, at the very bottom of his being, to believe that Jennifer Dash was truly free. Miles was on a mission now. Get to the engineer. Remake the Graviton box. Multiply its strength. Start saving people. Miles would be Virgil to the world's Dante Alighieri. He'd free billions of Earthbound slaves if he could. He'd save the world and then go through it himself. Then he'd earn the right to be with her. To be with Jen. But where was the engineer? As it turned out, Sir Isaac had spent months in Nairobi, Kenya before meeting up with Miles. That seemed like a good enough place to start. By plane, train, and automobile, Miles found himself in Nairobi itself. It took some heavy lifting, but Miles eventually got word that Isaac had stayed at the Emboseli Serena Safari Lodge, which rested nestled at the base of Mount Kilimanjaro, surrounded by blooming acacia trees and a surprisingly haunting natural stream. This was a five-star getup, no doubt. Upon arrival, Miles convinced the hotel staff to let him peruse the lodge's files. He managed to pull up Isaac's room from the database. Miles went and knocked not on Isaac's room, but on the doors of the rooms to either side. The first door that opened was clearly a local's. He had no knowledge of any soft-spoken white guy scientist, let alone any knowledge of who the white guy scientist liked to hang out with. But the next door didn't open. Miles had to pry it. Upon jerry-rigging it open, an African man huddled behind the bed. The bed's mattress pulled off and erected horizontally like a wall. In his hands, the man pointed a revolver at Miles. Who are you? Miles Fall. I want to replicate your work. You're an engineer, aren't you? I was with Sir Isaac when he... when he passed away. 
You know him, the man asked, his hands quivering horribly. Yes. And you know his people? I am his people, Miles answered. There is a note in my pocket. Take it. The man turned the gun on himself. On a plane headed back to America, Miles read the note once more. It read, The portal only works with virgin sacrifice. The mad Arab tells me so. I am damned. I am damned. I am damned and I am responsible. I don't want to be. I pray God forgives me. Dr. Merkel was not a natural fugitive. He didn't play the part well. He wasn't much for running around and hiding. That just wasn't his style. Not the image he was made to be. But Merkel did have money. And as he sought to seek employment from his new campaign, he paid good dollars to get his face mashed up and painted. In this world after the bombs, only cold hard cash and actual goods retained their value. Merkel had both. He paid surgeons to change his appearance. And he paid well. After the bombs dropped, there were four ways in which the people of Earth sought out preservation. The most common was perhaps as it should be. Men and women bowed their heads to the ground. They stopped reading newspapers. They let their cell phones run out of juice. They took out their plows and tilled the ground below their feet. Food and water were problems now. Once again, as it once was generations ago, simply living was hard work. The second way of preservation was to seek out religion. The Druidry Center at Newgrange, Ireland saw a rabid influx of devotees. The controllers struggled to keep up with huddled masses hoping for a ray of sunshine amidst ever-churning seas of despair. Losing Lorna von Schloss, Miles Fa, Marshall Winston, and May Ime was like losing a drop of water from a bathtub. Their absences were not missed. There was no shortage of replacements. For every creed, every color, every personality. The third avenue of seeking preservation came from outer space. Or rather, a hope centered on the cosmos beyond the reach of our best telescopic instruments. Long debunked programs like SETI suddenly jolted to life again. We humans had screwed ourselves. Maybe a savior from the stars would pity our misery and become our messiah. Fourth, and finally, preservation was sought through the sacredness of a new generation. Older folks had destroyed the planet in body and soul. Maybe the one thing we could still do was save our children, teach them the folly of our own ways. This manner of comprehension was the sort that brought the Onmo Center into existence. The letters in Onmo standing for Operation No More Orphans. The POTUS, the President of the United States, had rounded up the resources for the center weeks before the outbreak of nuclear holocaust. He would die one day, that president, content that he at least did that much. No one could take that away from him. He did that much. He saved some children, just some. But in this hellscape, that was something, wasn't it? Scout Further was one of the first to make it to the center. Upon arriving at the undisclosed location, both by train and by plane, most of the children were shell-shocked and quiet. But the quiet didn't last long. The idea behind the center was to give the children as much autonomy as possible. This sounded good, giving the children space to learn their own lessons and challenge each other in education. But in reality, it made the whole place feel like a prison. For security purposes, no child was allowed outdoors. In fact, much of the center was built underground. There were very few rooms with windows. The creators of Anmo weren't entirely inept at understanding the human spirit, however, 
They did fashion a greenhouse the size of a football stadium, as well as an auditorium with windows canvassing the entire ceiling. So, the children did have opportunities to receive vitamin D from the sun. The pressure points, of course, was the absolute security of the center. The place was built so that it would be virtually impossible to find. This had to include satellite photography. If the center was found, well, then it was game over. For this reason, the Onmo Center was fashioned to look like a giant chemical plant out in the middle of nowhere. And, to a large extent, this was true. Scout Further's job, every morning, was to pull levers managing the mixture of gaseous chemicals on a grand scale. You see, Scout was one of the cogs in the Onmo device. The children all ate Malandrinian, a synthetic biscuit. Malandrinian came in a variety of flavors, each imbued with different necessary vitamins, minerals, proteins, carbs, etc., etc., etc. These children would not be malnourished, and they would not enjoy eating. The adults at Anmo, save for the foreman herself, who refused to be called anything but Mother Foreman, were not allowed to form relationships with the children. The adults gave instructions, such as how to combine certain chemicals, but they were not to express affection, love, comedy, anything. They might as well have been robots. Fights were common. It took only a few weeks for gangs to form. They were not gangs in the traditional style. You see, it started simply enough. One boy got in a fight with another. Fist fights were broken up pretty quickly by the adults, referred to, by the way, by the inmates of Onmo as simply dolts. Dolts wouldn't let you beat Johnny to death, but they didn't seem to notice if he stole some of Johnny Boy's food. Or, if you stole food from Johnny Boy's best friend. Or, steal from that girl that Johnny Boy's best friend kinda liked. In this way, cliques formed, and support groups congregated. Johnny Boy asked Taddeus, the 200-pound Hawaiian kid, to protect his group. In exchange, Johnny Boy got someone to finish Taddeus' miles on his stationary bike. Much of the center's energy came from the children's stationary biking. Each child assigned a certain amount of miles to ride each week. Scout learned quickly that she was prized rather highly by several gangs. This was not good. She wished she wasn't noticed, but she was cute. Boys just wanted to be around her. Girls wanted to be her best friend. She would have to be cunning to not end up as some pawn chip in a gang's wide parlay or negotiation. It was only October in the Onmo Center, and it was already cold. Winter had come early. Speaking of cold, Marshall Winston was in Kathmandu, Nepal. He asked around. It didn't take him long to find Bloody Eddie. After all, there weren't many folks in Kathmandu that fit the description of one-eyed Scottish redhead. Bloody Eddie lived in a certifiable mansion that half overlooked the slummier side of Kathmandu. From time to time, the Druidry Center needed certain things. Therefore, there needed to be a system in place for acquiring stuff from the outside world. Bloody Eddie was one of the oldest and most trustworthy traders with the center. Marshall had worked with him a few years back when it was necessary to get a couple of Chinese passports made. Bloody Eddie was the type of guy that had connections. He had his finger eternally on the pulse of the black market. More specifically, he was the point man for most of Asia. He knew where things were. In this instance, Marshall Winston wasn't looking for a thing, but a person. Marshall had good reason to believe that the man he was hell-bent to find lived somewhere in the Himalayan mountains, somewhere close by. If anyone knew of his whereabouts, Bloody Eddie would be the one. It's one thing to be a Scot. It's another to be a classically long-haired, braveheart-inspired redhead. It's yet another to have had one of your eyeballs blown out by a firecracker in a deal gone wrong years ago. It's yet still quite another thing entirely to be all of those things, on top of which be a millionaire, and be living in the foothills of the largest mountain range on Earth. For all these reasons and more, Bloody Eddie had an answer. He swore he knew where the man of Marshall's yearning dwelt. But it would cost. Specifically, it would cost Marshall $500,000. Marshall was a ward of the Druid state. He didn't have any sort of loot on him. There was just no way he could come up with that sort of cash. Not now, not in ten years. At least, not aside from the Druidry's eyes. If his mission was center-approved, the money would be there, no problem. 
the center would work it out, but that would undermine Marshall's whole plan. He was going rogue now, at least until he figured everything out, at least until he got his head on straight. Bloody Eddie was a reasonable man. If Marshall didn't have the funds to pay the bill, there were always other ways to pay a debt. In this case, Bloody Eddie apparently was in need of a particular thing. A thing that Bloody Eddie happened to be absolutely sure Marshall had. He needed a white, preferably European, finger. Specifically, Blood Ed said, he needed a no-nami left-hand finger. It took a little while to figure exactly what no-nami meant, but they talked it through. The cost of finding Marshall's man was to be his left ring finger. Bloody Eddie would travel all the way to the man's home with Marshall. Then, upon arrival, he'd exact his payment with a flick of a very sharp knife. Marshall agreed, with two caveats. When they got there, Bloody Eddie would wait outside while Marshall talked to the man. He wouldn't claim the finger until after Marshall asked the man what he needed to ask him. Secondly, Bloody Eddie would transport Marshall anywhere he needed to go after the meeting, and after the finger was dislodged. And like that, the deal was done. The men shook hands. Bloody Eddie insisted, though, that they shake left hand to left hand. Unconventional for sure, but necessary so that Eddie could make sure Marshall's left hand ring finger was in fair shape. It was, and they left for the mountains that afternoon. As they discovered, the old man lived in a cave, just up outside of the Dolpa region of Nepal. Dolpa is considered one of the tallest elevated cities in the world. Marshall felt like he could never catch his breath. His head spun continuously like a drunk late in the evening on St. Paddy's Day, and his heart beat out of his chest. The mouth of the cave was covered with gold trinkets. Apparently, certain local visitors considered the man Marshall sought after as some sort of god king. It was poor sportsmanship to enter the cave without leaving a gold offering. Bloody Eddie shrugged, grinned his sick-headed man smile, pulled off a gold ring from his left hand no name finger, and motioned for Marshall to enter. See, Bloody Eddie's a good guy. He paid Marshall's way. Inside the cave. Hello? Hello? said an old voice. You don't speak Nepali? No, sir, said Marshall Winston. The voice came from the shadows. Ever so slowly, an old thing drenched in robes hobbled out toward the cave mouth, toward the light. Oh, Marshall said in astonishment. You're... you're Asian. I, I live in Nepal. I am Nepalese. But, uh, are you... Marshall trailed off. I have many names. Today, I go by the name Suchandra. Suchandra, king of the caves, a voice in Marshall's head repeated. I'm looking for... for the old father. The old father of Newgrange. The... the center. The Druidry. Sit down, boy. Marshall sat on the ice floor. I... I am of no interest to the Druidry. What price have you paid to find me? Uh, a dear one, Marshall said solemnly. I will answer two questions you have. Only two? Do you wish me to answer that? No, no, please. I, I must... Everything had a cost. All this way, Marshall wasn't even sure this was the right guy. It could be a setup Bloody Eddie had contrived. He needed to make his questions matter, and he needed to get it right. Tell me your name. The name you had while you served as fodder. It took the old bag of bones a while before answering. I was fodder there for a very long time. Yeah, you taught fodder back. No, I, I didn't. He has come long after I was already gone. I am very old, young man. Back then, I was Merlin, and I was King Arthur. You were both? You were both. Marshall tried to salvage his astonishment by turning his obvious question into a statement. Known ones go by many names. Over time, 
The different names separate themselves, turn into multiple personalities. Just like God. Marshall didn't get the God reference, but his fears were allayed. He hadn't told Bloody Eddie that he was searching for the original Merlin, so there was no way that Bloody Eddie contrived all this. Marshall was in the clear. Boy, do you have a second question? Uh, yes. Please, ask me. It is a labor for me to stay here with you. Do not waste my precious hours. Yeah, yes, yes, sir. My question. I have to know. I've been with the Druidry most of my adult life. That's all there ever needed to be. I thought it was right. It was... I, I wasn't naive. I knew it was dark. I knew it had warts and bad moments. But I was convinced, absolutely sure in my heart, that at its core, the Druidry Center was right. And it was good. Something's happened to you. Something's changed. Nah, nah, sir. Not exactly. I just... I don't know if I believe anymore. No, that's... that's not right. Those aren't the right words. I... I don't know if I have enough belief. You see, I... I doubt. Child, why do you doubt? Uh, I just... My question, Merlin... Please, I am Suchandra in this place. Uh, Suchandra, your majesty, how do I know if the Druidry Center is good and right? Why did you leave it? Did, did you discover something? Did you uncover a secret? Did someone tell you something? That is more than two questions, but... The old ragamuffin smiled. I... I have pity on you, for your question is good to my ears. Long pause. I left that place because I didn't want to fight anymore. Many of us have gone that way. The way of the middle. Not right, not wrong. Just being in the middle. But I'm not as you are. You ask if the center is good and if the center is right. Those are two different questions. And they very well may have two different answers. Do you know why people come to me? Uh, because you're wise. <laughs> many, many, many are wise. There are those walking among you that are much wiser than I. No. The people come to me. They offer me gold and silver in a nation that hungers for a monochrome of wealth. They do this because I give them instruction, direct instructions. Shall I tell you what to do? Yes, yes, please. Go back to the Druidry. Marshall's stomach dropped. Go back. You have not seen the bottom of the hole. Have you? Uh, Mama and Fodderbeck say it has no end. That it goes to the other side of the world. Is that what they're saying now? Go. And when it's dark, and no one can see you, go down the hole. Be careful not to fall or you will surely die. It's a long way down. But go. All the way. What you find down there, down there, at the bottom of all things. That will answer your question better than I ever could. Now, go. I must rest. Marshall Winston left the cave. Bloody Eddie took what was rightfully his and returned nine-digited Marshall Winston back to Ireland. 